let me take a swig of water first. Good. Well, first of all, uh, let me express my gratitude uh, to uh, particularly my in-laws' family that were absolutely willing enough to come and fellowship together with us on this day uh, that we call the Sabbath day. Actually, not we, not us. God calls it the Sabbath day. So uh, I'm tremendously grateful for your willingness and love uh, to come and celebrate this day with us. Uh, also, uh, I cannot overlook the fact that because in God's church, uh, it is not the second man in charge that speaks. It is the pastor that speaks as the main sermon, and then the deacons and the rest uh, do the sermonette. This time, he turned around uh, the this, this, this sheet of speaking himself. So he took the sermonette, and he's given me the opportunity, the privilege, and honor to do the sermon. So I'm very grateful uh, for that opportunity. And of course, it's a great honor and privilege to uh, address the rest of my brothers and sisters here in this area. Now, uh, he, when he was referring to South Africa, uh, you may not know that, but uh, let me uh, let you guys know. Uh, Mr. De Campos and I, uh, despite the difference in color, skin color, we have a whole lot in common. You see, I was born in Suriname, South America, which used to be a colony of the Netherlands. And he is from South Africa, has the same daddy and mommy, which is the Netherlands or Holland. So we have the same cultural background. We speak the same language. The only difference between him and I is that the Dutch that was taught to me is a little bit more sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so it's Dutch, as we say, it's kind of obsolete. But we understand one another. We can have a conversation. Uh, so we have much more in common than just be brothers in the church of God. But again, uh, it's a great honor and privilege uh, that you all have turned around. Uh, uh, he already made mention of the fact uh, that we have visitors from many areas, even our very close sister and friend, uh, uh, Millie, uh, that is coming all the way from Round Robin, Texas. Uh, round, round Rock. Round Rock. Round Rock, Texas, yeah. Uh, she was with us here uh, visiting uh, the ABC uh, classes, and uh, uh, that is not to enlarge our ABC vocabulary, but it's to know more <laughs> about the nature of God. I got you back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, uh, you know, we have quite a lot uh, that I would like to cover, so uh, uh, let's get in right away. The title of my message on this Sabbath day is Keep Hope Alive. It, it was amazing to see that uh, as uh, Pastor De Campos had uh, his message doing the sermonette, we never discussed anything. He only asked me, uh, what will you speak in about? And that was just a day or two ago. And I gave him the title and that was all. Uh, so it was amazing to see that uh, there will be a lot of touching points in what he said in a sermonette in comparison to what the main sermon uh, will be. Uh, and the title that I said, Keep Hope Alive, is pretty much a slogan that Many of you have heard before, I assume you have, uh, because uh, this slogan, Keep Hope Alive, uh, was used by a wannabe prominent African American that used that word. I'm not going to be politically incorrect, so I won't mention no name, but I'm pretty sure you have heard about this slogan before, Keep Hope Alive. Now, and I must confess that uh, I've been very intrigued with that slogan, Keep Hope Alive, uh, because, uh, you know, it, it, it weakens in me uh, some kind of motivation, some kind of inspiration. Keep hope alive. 
Uh, so, uh, I, you know, he caught my attention. But as we know, there's nothing new under the sun. So as we go on, you will realize that that was a borrowed phrase from that wannabe African-American. Because Jesus Christ encouraged his followers once before to keep hope alive. Only he did not use necessarily that phrase. So check me out. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. And if I may go too fast, then it is okay for you to jot down the notes so that when you go home, you all have some homework to do. <laughs> okay, so Luke chapter 21, uh, verse 36. And, uh, and this event uh, took place as Jesus Christ was discussing with his disciples the end of the age. And he said to them, Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So if you place some emphasis on the word watch therefore, what does watch therefore means? It means to constantly scrutinize one's walk with God in hope of his promises so let us not sleep as others do but let us watch sober let us watch our actions in sobriety because it's very important undoubtedly uh, many of us know a lot of people quite a number of people uh, who express hope for their situations which seriously beg for solutions. But hope, however, demands actions. You cannot have hope without actions. So let me illustrate what I mean by that, that hope demands actions. I keenly observe, as I was a young boy, young, eight, nine, seven, as I began to understand things, uh, and I saw my father and others of his friends who were working for the Aluminum Company of America. I saw, I took note of the hard work, laborious, much labor. And uh, my parents were not that educated, so they could not tell me really what to do. It was an inner feeling in myself that militated against that kind of hard work. But as I said, hope without action moves you nowhere. You just stay on one place, just turning wheels. So I took note of that and I realized, I thought to myself, well, what must I do in order not to be involved in that kind of work that I simply hated? And I realized that all I had to do is pay attention to my teachers, my professors. With other words, make sure that I will acquire an education. And today I've had three, four children, three boys and a girl, and I made sure to teach them that education is the foundation of civil liberty. It doesn't matter whether you're black, whether you're orange, whether you're yellow, whether you're purple, when you got it here, you can get all over, anywhere. Even if you're not a Christian like us, that's the world we live in. It. So I made sure that I would not be part of it. And thank God I was able to elevate myself up to this day to not be necessarily constantly busy with the menial work and all that kind of stuff. And that's the same with Christianity. 
Christianity is a process. It's an ongoing process. So if we really mean business with God, we cannot not read the Bible. We cannot do things that we're not supposed to do. Because you have that deep love and desire to be with you, Father. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, some stories, some narratives out of the Bible because I'm not here to tell you about Stan Bromel. I'm here to talk about the Word of God, the Bible. And today I'm planning to read out of the King James Study Bible. So all my reading will come from the King James Study Bible. Uh, so we want to see today what the definition, the biblical definition is of keep hope alive. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the Old Testament in the book of Samuel. First Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1. We will not be staying only in First Samuel as uh, our pastor did in uh, Matthew. So we will be going through a few <laughs> uh, chapters in the Bible. But I know you got time for that because that's why we're here. So I said first Sam Samuel chapter 1 and we will be reading verse 1 to 20. Uh, let's see the history. We'll see a few things uh, less. Uh, you will also see the attributes of our God. Uh, now verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaeum Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Seth, and an Ephrathite. You know, as I read verse 1, I was wondering, what is all these names about? I'm not interested, quite frankly, but what it teaches us is that God is one of specificity. You need not try to figure anything for him. As the pastor alluded in his sermon. We don't need that as human beings. All we got to do is follow and listen. Uh, so we don't have to think well. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, he was the son of that. and No, no, no. He was a cousin of that. Oh, oh uh, he lived over there. No, none of that. God made sure to tell you exactly who he is talking about. So we do not have to think and come down with our own conclusion. As the pastor uh, so eloquently said in his sermonette. Verse 2. And he had two wives. We men don't get no ideas. okay? And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah. And the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Verse 3. And this man, uh, Elkanah, went up out of his city yearly to worship. Let's, let's stop there for a second. Yearly to worship. What, what, what is meant by that? Uh, what kind of Christianity are we talking about? Yearly. He went up to worship. Now, you don't have to turn there, but I will read to you because I looked it up. And uh, yearly stand for, we can find uh, the definition of yearly in Exodus, Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. You don't have to turn there. I will read it, but if you want to, you've got, you could do it. Uh, Exodus 34, verse 14. Uh, explains to us what this yearly is. And you see that verse 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Okay? And then we look at the way to worship. And the way to worship, as God says it, as I already showed, we do not have to figure out anything for him. Uh, we find out in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, a well-known verse by most of us. And it says, three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God. 
in the place which he shall choose in the feast of eleven bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles and they shall not appear before the Lord empty so we establish that we do not call any shot when we talk about true religion true Christianity we do not call any shots. We listen and we follow obediently what's written in his word, the Bible. So let's continue. Uh, I wanted to make that clear. It's always good to have a solid, strong foundation that we can build upon. Okay, and, and, and this, uh, and the two sons, verse 3, and the two sons of Eli, who was a prophet, uh, had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, because we already read about it yearly, and we had to worship, and went to worship, he gave to Penina his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, who was Penina, her sister, also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, make her angry, make her jealous, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Verse 8. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, And uh, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? And why don't you eat? And why is your heart so grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest, Eli was the priest of that area, sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. Verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she fouled a foul so, uh, and uh, said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me, and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a man child, which is a son, then I will give him unto you, Lord, all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. That was her own will. God did not tell her that if you had a son not to cut the hair. So let's take note of that. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth, meaning looking at her mouth, how, how her mouth was going. So, uh, what, what is she basically saying? Uh, because she is sitting beside. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, and only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So the Eli, the prophet, could not hear what this woman had to say. Uh, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. You see? Wrong perception. See how we are human beings? We jump so quickly to conclusions thinking, you know, for yourself. And Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from yourself. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrow spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not your handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken Hitherto, let me uh, uh, explain quickly what uh, daughter of Belial means. Daughter, of, the term daughter of Belial means a worthless, wicked woman. Uh, so uh, 
Then Eli, Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition and you, that you have asked of him. And she said, uh, Let your handmaid find grace in your sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And let's jump to verse 20, and it says, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So we have noticed actually a woman who steadfastly kept a hope of getting a child of her own though almost discouraged by the prophet Eli so you see it through persistence of Hannah the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob permitted that hope to materialize so that's an amazing story. Let's take a look at our present society that we are living in. Once again, it was kind of highlighted by our pastor before. But I'll go a little bit more in details. With other words, let's bring it closer to home. What do we see? We are seeing a society in which crime has increased. You just heard it of what's going on in Cincinnati. For me, coming from Florida to Cincinnati, I look at it as a very peaceful place. So quite frankly, I was kind of shocked to hear what's going on in Cincinnati. I would not have been that shocked if I had heard that about Kentucky. But mind you, I love Kentucky. No, no, I want you to know I love Kentucky very much. If George de Campos, the pastor, would ask me to come over here, I'm here yesterday rather than today. But I'm, I'm honest, if I heard about any crime increase in Kentucky, uh, I would say, yeah, well, it's expected. But Cincinnati, no. So I was kind of shocked to hear that. Uh, we are seeing a society, like I said, in which crime has increased. Gambling, sexual promiscuity, Riots, air and water pollution, traffic congestion all over. When we were coming, not this morning, we noticed quite some traffic congestions. Noise and lack of solitude. We are seeing, above all that, an upsurge in drug usage, notably marijuana, being increasingly accepted by large numbers of the society. Uh, before I came to Cincinnati, I watched the news on Fox and I saw some mind-boggling news and that is that there is a pastor, a man actually that calls himself a pastor in the state of Indiana and he has a church and he is saying that actually he is pontificating the use of marijuana in his church in the state of Indiana. I watched that two weeks ago on Fox News in Florida. Uh, so it, it was amazing. Uh, that to him is an absolutely normal thing to use marijuana. Uh, and last but not least, the intensified social, ethnic, and racial conflicts globally and in our beloved United States of America. Quite frankly, this foolishness that's going on and all those anti-law sentiments has so much advance that some have declared overt war against law enforcement. How stupid can you be? Uh, as an ex-police, look, I've always said, whatever crime you commit, I understand that because that's our human nature that's our human tendency but once the police the cop the law enforcer shows up 
and he flashes either his best or his human being speaks for himself you better go down on your knees the game is over so for this society you know to do what they do I simply boggles my mind hence we continue praying thy kingdom come because this cannot continue going the lamentation as I said of default Christians is clearly and loudly heard among ourselves. <laughs> Just like Hannah, we also as God's people have a petition. As I said, we pray daily for the kingdom of God to come, not only for us, but our family and beloved friends as well. Let us act, I would say, a little bit pedantic. And it means... Uh, we're gonna act biblically scholarly so uh, and let's look at these two very synonymous words that we will be talking about the first one is faith and according to Webster Webster defines faith as uh, unquestioning belief specifically in God and complete trust and confidence the biblical rendition for faith is faith is the things hoped for the evidence of things not seen immediately I add and that is found in Hebrew chapter 11 verse 1 the second word I wanted to talk about is hope again I went to Webster's new dictionary and hope is defined as a feeling as a feeling that what is wanted will happen a desire accompanied a desire accompanied by expectations a person or thing on which one may base some hope I can give you an example of what I just read faith and hope this morning we left our uh, residence in Cincinnati uh, pastor also in the same area many of you in different areas and we all uh, use our vehicles to get here we have faith and hope first in God that he would be finally intervene to see you safely to this destination and that your means of transportation would hold up and cause no unpleasant problems to any one of you. I've seen on our way here quite a number of cars stall alongside the highway. They had problems with their wood up, so I understood that they had problems. So it didn't work for them, but it worked for us. So faith, as I said, is the things hoped for but the evidence now seen because we are here so we say hallelujah praise God you got us here so hence we could listen to what we're doing here friends and brethren we must allow the story of Hannah to become efficacious since these two nouns hope and faith are one of the very very important ingredients to overcome this I call it ignorant dark and Satan ruled world and this that I just said is quite frankly not an allegation and we we'll, you will see it turn with me please in your own Bible to 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 in the New Testament 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 2nd Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 4. Thank you. I made, an, I made a statement that this world is dark, ignorant, and Satan ruled. Let's see if God thinks the same as I just said it is. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them and I tell you 
We in this church are very, very persuasive. We are no salespersons, as the pastor said. We are no salesmen. But what we sell is what's written in the Word of God. So to let this point stick, let's go to Revelation, the last book in your Bible. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Let's see what we find there. And see if we can bridge it with what we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And it says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So you see, I said we're going to be a little bit scholarly. So when you look at verse 9, you see that the word deceives is written in the present tense. Which means it's happening now as we speak. It is not written in the past tense. Neither in the perfect tense, because the perfect tense would be an action that took place and came to an end to a close. It was done, it's over with, there is no more deception going on. That time will come though, in the millennium. But right now, we're living in a world as it is. So we see how Satan goes about his business. Hannah, as we just saw in Samuel chapter 1, was like one of us a mortal physical human being but strongly showing hope and faith in the Almighty she worshiped God in spirit and in truth and not take note of that not in her own devised and imaginary way it's very, very important. Once again, our pastor referred to that. I'm not speaking outside the boundary. Let's back it up. We're in the New Testament. Let's look in John chapter 4, verse 24. John chapter 4 verse 24 and it says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth very 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 important we must worship him in spirit and in truth Jesus Christ, who is the way uh, to the Father, is preparing us by telling us in advance the problems we may have to face, and yet not losing hope and faith. As we continue this sermon, always bring back to memory Hannah, because that's the example that we've used we're going to try to be like her. So, uh, Jesus Christ, as I said, uh, let's go, please, with me to John. You are, are already in John. So, let's go to a couple of uh, chapters of John chapter 16. John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 33 John chapter 16 verse 33 remember I said it before Jesus is preparing us in advance of the problems that we will have to face in this life okay John chapter 16 verse 33 these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world 
you will have tribulations but be of good cheer I Jesus Christ have overcome the world let's go in the front to Matthew the book of Matthew chapter 10 and we will be reading two verses there 34 to 36 Matthew chapter 10 34 to 36 and that's an amazing story that we're going to be reading and I know you all are pretty much aware of that and it says 34 think not that I am come to send peace on earth I came not to send peace but a sword for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law verse 36 and a man's foes shall be they of his own household man that quite frankly is hard hitting but you see that's Christ Christ has always called a spade a spade he lays it down he spoke plainly that is who and what we're dealing with but how is hope and faith acquired because that's the subject matter we're talking about in order to cope with this world hope and faith comes by studying hearing and understanding and obeying the written word of God I will repeat myself hope and faith come by studying hearing understanding and obeying the written word of God the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that faith and hope comes by hearing and hearing of what hearing of the word by the word of God but we've got to be careful because forgetfulness is an absolute destroyer of faith so we must guard ourselves against that we cannot forget of what we're doing without faith and hope we will have the tendency to throw in the white towel because we have no hope we have no faith the burdens of this life including physical conditions such as sickness disease infirmity and the most fearful and dreaded one death could weigh heavily on us and wreak havoc in the established hope and faith in God and our Lord, Master and Savior, Jesus Christ. These things, as the pastor alluded to, will be able to tug on you and throw your hands off and walk away. We cannot do that. It is not possible. We cannot do that let's look at some other biblical characters besides Hannah who did not allow tough and deadly conditions to rob them from the hope and faith they had acquired through the Holy Spirit of God we've been seeing a lot of stuff so let's dive into the book of Hebrews Hebrews chapter 11 and look at a few very as far as I'm concerned self-explanatory powerful and persuasive verses Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 Oh, I'm saying it, and I'm not turning to it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. 
verse 1. And uh, uh, we're going to stay in the book of Hebrew, Hebrews. And uh, chapter 1, and it says, no, not Hebrew chapter 1, Hebrew chapter 11, I said. Yes. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Let's look at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead, yet spoke. That's the legacy that he left behind. Let's jump over to verse 6 verse 6 but without faith remember we are talking about hope and faith but but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him Can we continue Verse 7, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Verse 8, by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whether whether he went let's jump all the way to verse 17 of the same chapter verse 17 by faith hope Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up, and he that and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Verse 23. By faith, hope, Moses, when he was born, was hit three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child the proper is good looking child because every child is proper <laughs> uh, proper child a good looking child healthy child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment that was verse 23 verse 25 Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. So you see, Moses could do that because he had hope and he had faith. You know, uh, as, as we talked about it, uh, he didn't know uh, what lied ahead of him, but he knew uh, he had that hope he had that faith and he kept hope and faith alive by doing what we just read in uh, uh, in verse 25 the pleasures of sin for a season he forgot about that verse 28 through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Verse 30. By faith, no, 
The walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. If that's not faith and hope, I don't know what is. I mean, here you're bringing down a magnificent fort, a magnificent city, powerful city. And all they had to do, according to the word of God, is march around that thing seven times. Blow that horn. And all came tumbling down. Now, if they could have stopped, aborted what Christ, what God had told them to do. But hope and faith were kept alive. Hence, we, they were able to see the result of their hope and faith. Verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. You all know that story. I don't have to go into that. Verse 32. 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak. Not the president. Barak Hussein. It's another Barak. Okay. I want to make that clear. <laughs> And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Verse 33. Who through faith, hope, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. Wow. Let's drop down to verse 36 to 40. We will be reading verses 36 to 40. And it says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn as on the meaning just split apart. Were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. So you see, these people could do that because they had given up this world, has taken us nowhere, so I forget about it we're going to remain focused on God and Jesus Christ for his promises that he has given us they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth and these all having obtained a good report through faith and hope received not the promise so we this morning as we left our place we arrived here safely so <coughs> faith is the things hoped for the evidence of things not seen we have seen that but they have not seen the promise that God promises and we have not seen that either so I want to clarify that but I wanted to show you how much strength how much belief, how much hope, how much faith these people had to do what they do, what they did, in spite of our problems that we're going through today so far cannot be compared of all the situation that I've read about. None of us are going through it yet. Yeah, family members can kick you in your rear and uh, you know leave you alone and all that but we haven't gone through that yet thank God for that but let us be prepared because it is not an improbability it can and could happen so let's be mentally spiritually and physically prepared for that if it comes our way we ain't copying out God has been provided some better things for us that they without us should not be made perfect that they without us 
should not be made perfect. And here it comes, friends and brethren. Of everything that I said so far, this is the substance of everything that we have read. We are in the book of Hebrew. Go back and go to verse 13. I intentionally pass that off because that is what to me says it all. Verse 13. As we just illustrated the Bible of all the heinous and terrible and horrible situations that those brethren of us had to go through. They held fast. And it says in verse 13, these all died in faith and hope because they hoping to be resurrected. Not having received the promises but having seen them afar off, way off in their mind, imagination, fruitful imagination that will materialize just as Hannah's uh, hope and faith materialize. And were persuaded of them and embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. in the very end. It is worth it all in the face of what this world has to offer us to absolutely keep hope, faith, a life forevermore. Will you turn with me for the final scripture to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and we will be reading verse 12 and 13, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. And it says, that's about the unity of all believers and it says first let's start at verse 11 to put it in context wherefore remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands verse 12 that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having, there we go, no hope, no faith, and without God in the world. That's how we left before. Today that's not the case, hopefully anymore. But now, as it says in verse 30, now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made closer, has been brought closer by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our hope, our hope in God is real. The return of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom on earth, his kingdom on earth, and bringing lasting peace to a very troubled world as we sing it and living in it as an absolute assurance. Will you, all of you here in this facility, keep hope? Alive. As far as I'm concerned, my wife and I will keep hope alive. 